Good evening, everybody. I'm really delighted to be back in South Bend and very delighted to be able to bring you the results of our study because they are very, very fi positive findings. And I think you'll be very pleased to see that down, downtown South Bend can truly become a residential neighborhood as well as a business center. Uh, we've had a little bit of technical problems here, so sorry for the delay in the meeting, but that gave everybody else a chance to get a seat. So we're glad to be here. I thought I first would explain our method, a little bit about our methodology, because as Scott pointed out, it really is what has helped us be so acute in the identification of downtown housing markets, the depth of that market, and what financially those people who would choose to live in downtown can afford. Uh, we call it market potential rather than demand. And I don't know if any of you have ever been familiar with conventional market studies, but those usually focus on what they call demand for housing. But since that's generally based on increases in households in a given area and a lot of new development so that a potential developer can find his niche, his or her niche, um, it didn't really work for us because our early work was in cities that were losing population. But we came to understand that if you could understand who the market was, what they were able to pay, and where they were coming from, you could actually uh, develop a housing program that would meet their preferences, and you could actually turn a city around. Um, so these are the questions that our study generally answers, ranging from where does the market live now, who are they, how much can they pay for the new dwelling units, and from a developer's perspective, which is a very important point, how fast will those units lease up? Um, we looked at a very specific study area. Um, the study area boundaries were devised in conjunction with the city. And in the north, it's the river and uh, Corby Boulevard. And then on the east, into the east bank, to Hill Street and over to Saint, down to St. Louis Boulevard, Monroe and South Street to the south, and Taylor, William, and Lafayette to the west. Uh, I hope you can see the red line. Uh, yeah, it's pretty visible. Um, <laughs> I hope the battery didn't die on this. <laughs> there we go, too far. I thought it was important to um, discuss what has happened across the country and here in South Bend in terms of the last five to seven years. As you know, uh, we have experienced a tremendous crash in the housing market nationally and uh, here in South Bend which has had a huge impact on the types of housing and where people are choosing to live now. That crash has uh, led to financial circumstances that rival only the Great Depression in terms of the kinds of value destroyed. There was more than $7 trillion worth of housing value lost during the housing crash which was quickly followed by the stock market crash. So those of us who managed to keep our houses at least found that we lost a lot of savings and a lot of the money that we had set aside for retirement. In conjunction with that, we've been experiencing steadily rising energy costs, which has a real impact on the kinds of housing now that people are choosing to live in. If it's too far from where they work, the gas prices, as they continue to rise, will make that housing more and more expensive. And if it's too large, people are now reconsidering because of the cost of heating and cooling that house. And for builders and developers and for people who want to buy housing units, there's tight credit now. Uh, it's very difficult for a builder developer to get financing, and it's very difficult for potential home buyers to get a mortgage. Um, the most important factor from our perspective on what has transformed the housing market nationally and here in South Bend is the fact that today we are a very different nation from who we were 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago. Today, the housing market is dominated 
by the two largest generations in American history, in the entire American history. The baby boom, I'm sure all of you are well familiar with the likes and dislikes of the baby boom and the fact that they had such a transformative effect on all kinds of aspects of American life. They total about 77 million people today. Um, we've always called them the pig and the python, because as you know, if a python swallows a pig, it's this big bulge that moves along its body. Well, that's what the baby boom did as it entered each new phase. It got to kindergarten, and all of a sudden, elementary schools were having to build more classrooms. Same thing with high school. When they went out into college, colleges were having to build more dormitories. When they entered the job market, new rental apartments. There was a huge boom in apartments. And today, uh, those baby boomers are moving into empty nesting and retirement, which means that they've got different life stages than they had when they were raising their families or when they were entering the job market, and different housing preferences as a result. Their children, the millennials, who have now exceeded them in size, about 78 million millennials born between 1977 and 1996, are, being, are as transformative a generation as the baby boomers, but in entirely different ways. If you look at that same uh, Python uh, analogy um, and look at where, oh gosh, I'm sorry, uh, look at where the millennials are today. They are entering the job market. They are uh, going out, leaving their parents' homes, hopefully, although a lot of them don't have uh, jobs that enable them to live on their own. And uh, some of them are getting married, although I have to say, not very many of them are looking for detached houses. So what we have uh, is the convergence of the two largest generations in America, both of them with similar kinds of preferences in terms of the kinds of housing they're looking for. We have boomers moving down. Uh, a lot of baby boomers would like to move out of the single family house in which they raise their children because that house no longer matches their life stage, the lifestyle. They want to be able to travel and not have to worry about what's happening to their house when they leave. Um, the millennials, their children, are trying to move out of the house and form their own households. And when they do, they choose to move into vibrant downtown neighborhoods, mixed-use neighborhoods, places where they don't have to drive a car, places where they can walk to work, places where they can walk to all the amenities that they are seeking. So this graph shows you um, the two different sets of columns, one representing the baby boom, one representing the millennials, and shows you that over the course of the next several years, we haven't even peaked yet in terms of the numbers of baby boomers and the numbers of millennials. So from our perspective, that means that we have basic demographic support for significant increases in downtown housing, not just all across the nation, but also here in South Bend. The two largest generations are mostly one and two person households. And that's really a key fact of what's happened to the housing market today. Because when you had a largely family market, single family detached houses were the dwelling unit of preference. If you're now moving into a market where it's mostly one and two person households, that single family detached house becomes much less important as an option to those households. Today, 59% of all US households contain just one or two persons. 63% of all households here in the city of South Bend contain just one or two person households. So that is a big change from 20 years ago when that number was probably more like 35%. And the largest percentage of households were family households. Nationally, nearly two thirds of all home buyers are singles or couples. And that's very counter to the idea that most of us have of who is actually buying dwelling units in this country today. Um, the 
National Association of Realtors did a survey, and every year they update that survey as to who is buying in America. And they have found, year after year, it's really consistent that 8 to 9 percent of all home buyers, and that includes townhouses, condominiums, and single family detached houses, 8 to 9 percent of those home buyers are single men. 22 to 24 percent of all those home buyers are single women. And this is a trend that is continuing to grow as more and more women are breaking the glass ceiling, having uh, much more substantial incomes than they did in the past. And a significant number of them are deciding they're not going to wait to get married to buy a dwelling unit. They're just going to go ahead and do it now. Another 30 to 32 percent of all dwelling units purchased are being purchased by couples, not necessarily married couples, but by two people. And then the remainder, which is about 35 to 37 percent of home purchases, are made by traditional or what we call non-traditional families, which is not necessarily the mom, dad, two kids, the dog, and the cat, but uh, the much more 21st century family household, which can be any number of different configurations. Now, looking at South Bend as a whole, I thought you'd be interested in some of these statistics that are generally available about the city. This is as of this year. Uh, the population's about 100,700 people living here. The region, the Michiana, I'm never sure if I'm saying that right, region contains about 856,400 people. So you are a good-sized region, and that is very positive for the development of a strong core to that region. And South Bend is definitely the core city of this region. In terms of households, there are about 39,600. And as I said, almost 63% are one and two person households. The median household income is 32,400, which is pretty standard for Midwest cities. Um, we've done a lot of work in Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, and the cities in those states, the median income ranges from 30 to 35,000. Um, there are more than 46, thousand housing units of which 77 percent are single family detached units which from my perspective is one reason why we really need to focus on a lot of high density housing in the downtown to give people a choice beyond the single family detached house the median housing value is currently 87,000 which I'm sure that is very depressing to a lot of you but again, that is very typical of the Midwest, which actually never had the huge run-up in housing values that the East and West Coasts and Florida and Las Vegas did. And that's actually to your benefit that that didn't happen. Now, in downtown, um, we looked on the block group level to just see how many people and households are currently in downtown. Now, this isn't precise to the study area boundaries that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation, but it's an approximation of how many households, and probably pretty accurate. Um, in terms of population, there's just under 3,000 people who live here in just under 1,500 households. The astonishing thing to me was that 82% of them are just one and two person households. Very few families living in the downtown study area. Median household income is 23.5, which again is very typical of downtowns across the country. Uh, some of the housing units are not occupied because there are more than 1,700 of them, but the median housing value in the study area is 99.2, which is higher than that for the city as a whole. So, why would anyone want to live in downtown South Bend? Now, I think a lot of you have already answered that question for yourselves, that you actually see that there are a lot of reasons why. When we were here in April, we conducted a number of focus groups and interviews with a lot of people who live here in South Bend and asked them what they thought were the best things about downtown that could attract 
a, a, a potential market to want to live here. And these were just some of the places that they noted. The Cove, which I understand the Cove has a game on tonight in competition with us. Leaper Park, and obviously the St. Joseph River, which is spectacular. Um, and there are lots of cities that don't have such a beautiful river, so you're very, very lucky to have it. Uh, new restaurants, an art museum, theaters, and of course, a divine place, which I frequented several times when I was here in April, the chocolate cafe and store. Um, the assets of downtown are considerable, ranging from the variety of historic buildings that are still in the downtown. The fact that it is a center of employment, not the largest, but significant numbers of people work in downtown. There, the, most of the culture and ent entertainment in the city are located here. Shopping and dining is located here. We've heard this over and over from people about all the wonderful new restaurants that have opened up. It's very walkable. And we have been in a number of cities where to get from one end of downtown to the other, you would need a full day to walk it. This is a very walkable downtown, and I think that actually lends its attractiveness as a place to live. And the river and the parks. I mean, I cannot emphasize how important the river and the parks are to people. Amenities are what make a neighborhood. And the ability to bike, to walk along bike paths, along the river, through parks is invaluable. And you already have a lot of that in place. And location and access. I found for myself that you're not all that far from Chicago, which is the big city, and you are 30 miles from Lake Michigan. I mean, that's a, a real asset that lots of places don't have. Very easy to get to the interstate, and those are all very important factors for when people decide where they're going to choose to live. And then let's not forget that you are in very close proximity to the University of Notre Dame, which is the largest employer in the city. And what we have found in the 60 other downtowns that we have done these studies, that if there is a university present, that there is a significant market among the employees, the professors, the students of that university for downtown housing. And that is what is going to help fuel the growth in downtown housing here in South Bend. So where does that market live now that might potentially move to downtown? Well, 39% of that market is already living here in South Bend. Um, another 28% would be moving from elsewhere in the county. 5% of the potential market is moving from Chicago, 7% from elsewhere in the region, and 21% from the rest of the US with a, a large number of Indiana, Michigan, uh, Illinois counties, but also other counties with major cities in them like LA, New York, because people tend to, to move from one city to the next quite frequently. How many households actually represent the annual potential market for downtown? More than 1,000 households per year are the type of households that would choose to live in a downtown, in the downtown of South Bend. Now, these are all households that can afford what we call market rate housing. We decided to focus on mar market rate housing, which is what numerous cities have done, because in order to attract a significant number of retailers to the downtown, they need to be, those retailers need to be able to study the demographics and see that there is sufficient income to buy the products that those retailers would be selling. So what we have found in other cities is that once there is a significant amount of market rate housing produced in the downtown, then it is very, a very positive step to do mixed income housing so that there are housing opportunities for everyone who would choose to live in downtown. So in the city of South Bend, almost 4,500 households a year are moving within and to the city, of which more than 1,000 of those households would choose, if there were appropriate housing units available, to live in the downtown. 
So who are those people? I mean, it, understanding who they are is critical to understanding what kind of housing they would choose and what needs to be produced then to attract those households. 81% of the potential market are what we call younger singles and couples. Now we divide uh, households into three general categories, younger singles and couples, family households, and empty nesters and retirees, because those represent three major life stage where people have very definite preferences about where they want to live, what kinds of units they want to live in, what kind of flexibility they want in terms of being able to pick up and move if they need to or want to. And younger singles and couples are the dominant market here. Now that's partly because you have so many universities and colleges in the city. But that again is really positive because those are the kinds of households that really like to live in a downtown environment. I mean, I think that that's one of the reasons for the success of Eddy Street Commons is they have created a very viable, walkable, mixed use environment, which is what people really like to be in. They like to be able to go downstairs and go to a bar and have a drink or go to a restaurant and have dinner and not have to get in a car and go. <laughs> I'm s um, one of the largest of the younger singles and couple groups we call small city singles. And these are where most of the students are found. Um, They're very technologically astute, way beyond where the baby boomers are. And they are most, mostly single households. They're mostly renters. Um, another group we call 20-somethings. And these are mostly the young professionals who typically choose to live in a mixed-use environment where, again, they can walk to amenities. They're mostly singles, but there are some couples, um, pre-children. The empty nester and retiree segment is about 12% of the market. And again, in many instances, this can be a larger percentage of the downtown market. But what's happened is because of the difficulty of financing for condominiums, uh, and the inability of a lot of people to either sell their house in order to buy a condominium or um, to get a mortgage to buy a condominium, the empty nester and retiree market is a bit depressed right now, but I guess in more ways than one. Uh, and um, I, we expect that in the next two, three, four years, when, the condom when condominiums financing is more generally available to developers, that that market will come back. And it, there's probably going to be significant pent up demand. Um, one of the larger groups is what we call new empty nesters. These are people whose children have finally moved out of the house. And they are finding it very liberating. They're now just the two of them. And they are definitely a, a, a prime market for living in a downtown. Affluent empty nesters are another large group they're somewhat older. They've already, their kids have been gone for a while, and they are being very judicious about where they choose to live. Um, older couples also like to move in once the neighborhood has been established. Young people are, are what we call risk oblivious for the large part, and will actually move into neighborhoods where the rest of us would maybe go, oh, I don't know about that, and they'll think, cool. Um, the family market is the smallest of all, 7%. And that's because the type of housing beyond the townhouses, which is part of our uh, potential market here, uh, they generally, outside of New York, Chicago, San Francisco, there aren't too many families that choose to live in multifamily buildings. So it's a, a very small percentage of the market, although, again, that's starting to change all over the country, we're seeing more and more downtowns that are having a, a larger and larger percentage of the units occupied by families who are, particularly if there is a school located close to the downtown where their children can go, where they're happy with that school, because that is a very powerful reason for the choices that families make where to live is the quality of the school. 
And here we have multi-ethnic families. A lot of these could very easily be professors at the universities. And full nest urbanites, uh, again, probably transferred here from another city and would seek the kind of housing that they lived in before. And so they are a market for downtown housing here. So when we, you look at the aggregate of all that, those households, what kinds of housing units would best match their housing preferences? And not surprisingly, because we have found this in the last couple of years to be true of just about every city that we have done these studies in, including updates, I'm not standing in front of you, um, about 64% of the potential market would choose to live in a rental apartment. Uh, another 14% would choose a condominium, and 22% a row house or a townhouse. Now, this switch to rentals, which has been happening over the last few years, is driven by young people who not only have they not been able to save the money for a down payment, but so many of them are saddled with enormous debt from having gone to college that they figure it's going to be years before they can ever afford to buy anything on their own. And they have also become very leery about the, the, all of the positive aspects of ownership because of what has happened during the housing crash. So instead of a percentage of the younger market being a market for, for sale housing types, they are practically totally in uh, preferences for rentals. So we also, while we were here in April, took a look at what kind of choices people currently have, not limiting it just to downtown, but to what other kind of properties that are available, what their rents are, what the unit sizes are, just to see what kind of choices people have. And these are just three of the properties that we looked at, Central High, the Foundry, which is over at Eddy Street Commons, and the Point, the Central High and the Point are both in downtown. And general rent ranges start at about $415 to almost $3,500 a month for a small studio of 400 square feet to a three bedroom apartment of about 1,500 square feet. In the for sale market, we have uh, townhouses, uh, one here on the East Bank and two over by the university. General price range is about 180,000 to over 450,000 uh, for 815 square foot two bedroom units to nearly 2,700 square foot four bedroom apartments, these are very huge, townhouses actually, and that uh, price per square foot ranges from about 114 to $270 per square foot, which is pretty typical of other cities here in the Midwest. So what we did was look at all those households that comprise the potential market, of which 665 of them would choose rental apartments. And we looked at what the incomes of each of those household groups were, and to see how much they could afford to pay in terms of rent. And 8% of those 665 households could only afford rents between 750 to 1,000, 28% uh, from 1,000 to 1,250, and the largest number percentage was 35% at 1,250 to $1,500 a month. Now that does seem like a lot, but one of the things that we have learned is that people who choose to live downtown feel that they can actually pay more to live downtown because they're not spending a lot of money on gas. They're able to walk to a number of places that other people who don't live in downtown have to drive to. So from our perspective, looking at what those people could afford in terms of rent, we propose that new units in downtown, rent should range from about 800 to about 2750 per month for 500 square foot to 1400 square foot lofts and apartments. Uh, young people don't want to know apartments. They like lofts. Um, we've conducted many focus groups with young people when we've done these downtown studies across the country. And over and over again, we hear, 
why did the developer think that's how we'd like to have our apartment designed? They'd much rather just have an open space with a bathroom and a kitchen, and they'll do the rest the way they like it. Um, again, looking at those households that represent the market for new condominiums, broken out by price points, um, you can see that the largest segment of the market is at the lowest range of 150 to 200,000. Now that's very typical. The pyramid for purchasing gets smaller the higher the price. There's, when you get to the very top of pricing in any market area, that's always where there are the fewest um, households that can afford those prices, with the exception of certain places like Manhattan, which are totally distorted by um, out of uh, uh, households who aren't even intending to live in those units more than a couple weeks a year. Um, as you can see, at 400,000 and up, only 4% of the market is able to afford that. But 4% of 140 households a year still equates to a number of units that could be produced in that price range. So we propose that base prices of condos built in the downtown should range from about 150 to 425 for 750 to 1,750 square foot units, which ranges in a per square foot basis of about $1.92 to 247. And finally, for row houses, townhouses, or live work units, uh, there are 220 households every year that represent the annual potential market for those units. And you can see that here we have a bulge kind of in the middle. And that's because the, the townhouse market sorts itself out by price as well as by preference. And so the, the largest single percentage group at 25% are those households that could afford units between 300 to 350,000. So we propose, again, to try to match those price points as closely as possible with prices ranging from about 225 to 475 for units containing about 1,000 to 1,800 square feet and at about 223 to 268 per square foot. Now that implies that all, all of the usual costs of doing business for a developer are having to be assumed by the developer. To capture that market potential, we looked at different capture rates. There is a higher capture rate of rental than there is of for sale because there are more people looking for rental and there are, uh, obviously it is easier for a, a household looking for a rental to actually sign up, move in, and start to live there than for someone who is purchasing a unit who would then be going through the whole bank approval and the mortgage. So uh, we, there is definitely a higher capture rate for rental, rental units. We believe that based on very realistic capture rates of the potential market, uh, downtown could absorb 66 to 98 new units a year, 12 to 14 new condominium units a year, and 19 that should be 22, not 122. <laughs> I was going to say, oops, <laughs> sorry about that. I just gave somebody a heart attack, <laughs> myself included. 22 units a year, um, uh, which, uh, again, based on those price points that I outlined earlier in the presentation. Now. It isn't all roses. There are challenges to downtown. One of the uh, most important from the developer's perspective is the high cost of building, acquiring land and building new units or acquiring buildings and adapting them for residential use. That is a real uh, stumbling block to a lot of development that could happen in a downtown because given the fact that it's difficult to get financing, when you add that with high costs of redevelopment and development, a lot of developers tend to give up. Financing challenges again. Um, so many of our uh, builder developer clients uh, are frustrated 
by what they see as an emerging and strong market for downtown housing, and then the inability to persuade the local lending institutions that this is real and not fantasy, and would they please just help them acquire this site or provide the construction financing. But doing that, they pretty much have to hand over their firstborn son. Um, safety misperceptions. This was something that came up during all of those focus groups and, and all of the interviews that I had in April. Now, I call them misperceptions because time after time, we have found that the perception that downtown is safe is a totally erroneous, is unsafe rather, is a totally erroneous one. Um, some cities, actually Fort Wayne uh, in Indiana, uh, did a, uh, a, a comparison between the type and number of crimes in their local mall and the type and number of crimes in downtown and found that by far downtown was the safer place. And other cities have done the same kind of analysis and found that for some reason, it seems to be a popular thing to talk about how all these bad things happen in downtown, when actually that is a perception and not a reality. And that is one thing that we think is really important to try to overcome. Um, and it always helps to talk to your local newspaper about you know, pointing out the positive aspects of downtown rather than the negative. And there are, according to the people I interviewed, a lot of parking misconceptions. Um, uh, people were very descriptive about <laughs> the challenge of finding parking in downtown, when I guess a lot of it has to do with not understanding how the various garages work or where you can park on the street and where you can't. And that is a challenge, but one that we have found is easily overcome. Uh, last, a couple of years ago, we did a study in downtown Wichita, and part of the problem was being able to have enough parking for the people who are going to be living in all these new units. And we kept telling them, well, what we have found is that people actually, if they've owned two cars, will give up one of them to live downtown. Oh, no, no. Here in Wichita, we love our sport utes. We'll never give them up. Never, ever, and of course, I have been in touch with the Downtown Development Agency, and lots of new apartments have come online, and lo and behold, people are giving up that second sport ute. So it does happen. It happens over and over again, even in cities where the local populace did not believe it could ever happen. And then the lack of non-automobile transportation. It's really important to have a, a viable downtown that connects to the rest of the city to have a lot of different means of transportation. That includes bike routes, safe bike routes. Um, biking is taking off all across the country. And to be able to have uh, streets marked for, with, with bike paths is really important for people who want to bicycle. And then being able to have circulator routes that would go from downtown to the university and to any other location where there would be heavy traffic, it would be really important. Now, there are ways to get around a lot of these difficulties. And part of what we did in this uh, assignment was to discuss strategies to attract the market, to help developers, to overcome some of the challenges that are inherent in any downtown, not just in South Bend. And it's very important to create a variety of housing types. There are a variety of different people who would choose to live in downtown. And so you need to have a variety of different housing types to be able to attract the full market and not just a few who would only say prefer condominiums. You need to establish neighborhood guidelines. Uh, some of the most ill-advised projects I have seen happen in downtown is because uh, there was a perception that people wanted to live in the sub suburbs, and so they built a project that was very suburban in nature, and it failed miserably, because anyone who lives in the suburbs isn't going to be fooled by a suburban 
housing product located in downtown. They want the suburbs, not downtown suburbia. Um, it is also really important to preserve the built environment. I, I, it pains me sometimes to see buildings come down that would make wonderful residential conversions. And I think it's very important to understand that a lot of these class B and class C office buildings that are only partially filled, if they are converted to residential, it actually serves to tighten the commercial market. And we've actually seen in situations in cities where they have actually converted a number of office buildings to residential, that that actually created enough demand to build a new downtown office building, which is really important in the 21st century because it's very hard to retrofit older buildings with all of the technology that 21st century business now requires. Um, and it's also important to have new residential construction because there's a segment of the market that doesn't want to live in anything old. They only want to live in brand new housing. And so to attract that part of the market, you need to build new, new units as well. Having those units be mixed use is going to be really important over time because as there are more and more people living in downtown, there need to be locations where new businesses, new retailers can locate. So if you've done a new building, make sure that the ground floor space can be converted to retail once that retail market has established itself. And also, we have provided the city with a number of policies and programs, which I won't go through in great detail, but I will mention what some of them are, that will help facilitate the development of new housing in downtown South Bend. It's important, again, to encourage a mix of residential, civic, and non-residential uses. A downtown should become a neighborhood, not just for the people who live there, but for everybody in the city. Downtown is the one place where everybody can come and feel like it's their home, even if they don't live there. So it's very important when the first decisions about where to develop are happening, that a, a serious evaluation of the sites is, is, is taken to a, a, a very fine detail. Because if you make a mistake in some of the first buildings and first developments, it can be very hard then to generate the uh, critical mass that you'll require over time. So we advocate that when a site is selected, that there be advantageous adjacency, for example, with views of the river, because there's lots of people who like to look at water. Um, that there should be building and or, that's, this is a no-brainer, building and or land availability, because you don't really want to tear down anything. But uh, frankly, uh, we saw um, plenty of open parking lots that over time can become locations for new development. Potential for expansion. It's really important that if you've established one part of downtown as, as a residential location, that you are able to build on that and really create that critical mass that is required to bring in the retailers. And that if the project can't actually be a, in a potential for expansion, at least it should link to different parts of downtown and serve as something that would connect one part of downtown to another. It's really, really important to make sure that anything done in downtown is urban and not suburban. It is very important to preserve the urban fabric of downtown. And you have learned that lesson in restoring Michigan to, uh, uh, from a pedestrian-only um, street to one that has cars. Because cars today are the lifeblood of any city. If there aren't cars driving around in it, there aren't going to be very many people either. Respect for the urban context. Again, I have to say this over and over again. Downtown is an urban environment, and we must stay away from suburban uh, attitudes when we're trying to create new development in downtown. 
Streets should be designed for pedestrians. I can't tell you how often that is a mistake made by cities. You get these narrow sidewalks, and then you know, there'll be a street lamp post right in the middle of the, of the sidewalk. And so people have to go out into the street to get around it. I've taken many pictures of them. <laughs> um, and to continue streetscape improvement. It is very important to the pedestrian to be interested in what they're walking by. And if you do have an ugly parking lot with a lot of cars in it, there are ways to make that parking lot more attractive until it can become a location for actually a new building. Again, urban, not suburban. Buildings and front doors should face the street, not parking lot and garages. This is a, a pr particularly egregious example of a suburban type development that failed miserably in a downtown. It's also really important to market and monitor what's happening in the downtown. Um, if you don't keep track of what's happening in downtown, it's, it's easy to lose track of what you have already accomplished. It's really important to develop an image campaign. Now, this may sound silly, but what we have found that uh, uh, something that strikes a chord with the people who live in the city can be very effective in, in attracting them to the downtown. We worked for many years in Norfolk, Virginia, and they came up with some very simple mermaids, because it's, it's very water-oriented, and come home to Norfolk now, because a lot of people had moved out. And along with another, a lot of other th marketing and merchandising efforts that they made, and the incentivizing of a lot of downtown development, they've actually turned their uh, city around and have gone from a city that has lost population to one that is now gaining population which is what every city is aiming for that has lost population in the past. Merchandising, and that means the street furniture, the, the, uh, the garbage cans, the banners, all of those are very important in establishing an identity in the minds not only of the people who live here, but also the people who visit here. If you, you should have a very strong image of what downtown South Bend is. And all those banners and all those uh, sidewalk um, embellishments are what help people remember downtown. Another very effective thing to do is to have every year a downtown housing tour. Now, obviously, it's a little more difficult in the beginning when there aren't that many downtown units. But for example, in Louisville, Kentucky, the first year they decided to have a downtown housing tour. They hired one bus because they figured there wouldn't be that much interest. Well, so many people showed up that they had to go out and quickly get another bus to carry the people from place to place. And they only had six different apartments on this tour. Now they have to have several buses because it has become an annual event. People pay uh, to go on the tour. And that money supports the various cultural institutions in the downtown. And not only does it familiarize people with the housing in downtown, but it also helps market the existing units that are in downtown. Because what Louisville found is after every tour, there was always this surge of interest in people who really thought it was cool to have an apartment like what they had seen and we're really interested in getting one of those apartments and living in downtown. And to continue the special events that you have, because again, it's what gives downtown an identity in the minds of people who live here and in the minds of people who come here. Uh, among the programs and policies, city-owned land and buildings are critical to jump-starting downtown development because those are uh, opportunities for development where the land cost is taken out of the equation, particularly at the onset of this development. So that's really key to getting a lot of downtown housing going, and it has been the key in many, many cities across the country. 
Another really important tool is a gap financing pool. Now, I've talked about the financing challenges that face developers when they're trying to do downtown housing. Several cities have developed these financing pools where they approach the, the banks in downtown, the city puts in money, the county puts in money. In Detroit, they actually had all of the major employers put in money and establish a fund that then can be lent to developers doing particular projects at low or no interest. And when it's difficult to get financing, that can be the key to getting a lot of projects off the ground. Uh, a number of cities have live near your work programs where the employer can either grant the employee a certain amount of money for a purchase in the downtown or grant a certain amount of money towards rent in the down, to live in the downtown. And this is in many, many, many cities across the country and again has been very effective in helping to promote downtown living. Creative live workspace for artists. Every city has artists who are having a very hard time finding affordable places to live. And there are a lot of old buildings that would make wonderful lofts, live workspace for artists. And there are, there are many ways to create that using those buildings with a combination of historic and low income housing tax credits. Numerous cities, again, have done this. And what's magical about artist housing is usually on the ground floor, there are studios. Everyone loves to see what the crazy artists are doing. And it has transformed several main streets in several cities um, where they have actually said, OK, this is going to be our arts district. And within this district, there are going to be several incentives to encourage artists to live and work here. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that has been a terrific way of revitalizing that part of downtown and actually energizing development in other parts of the downtown. Tax incentives range from property tax exemption and abatement, which you can't do in a lot of places here because you already have a TIF. Now, that's great that you have a TIF. We've actually been in some cities that haven't done anything. And a TIF can be very effective in helping to get development off the ground. But in particular, especially if you're trying to encourage artists, um, Providence, Rhode Island uh, exempts artists from paying income tax in, if they live within the arts district in order, again, because they know that if artists don't have very much money and what they have, they're going to have to put towards the rent and food. So they at least try to lower some of the costs of living in the downtown by exempting them from income tax. And some cities exempt builders from paying any sales tax on materials that goes into downtown development, which is not a huge cost. But when you layer it with other types of incentives, it can make a project go from infeasible to feasible. So. What we're looking at here in downtown South Bend, after five years have passed, we will have 30 to 45% more dwelling units in the downtown, which means there will be greater housing diversity, lots more young people. And young people are who we really want to see downtown because they don't hang out in their apartments. They hang out on the street. They're meeting up with their friends everywhere. They don't, they don't nest. Uh, and greater income diversity. And that means that downtown South Bend will have achieved an urban mode, which is what the mayor was talking about earlier. And in 10 years, the population of downtown will probably more than have doubled because all these incentives and developers will have created lots of new units to accommodate the the size of the potential market for new housing in downtown South Bend. So thank you very much. That's the end of the presentation. <laughs>